So welcome everyone back to Whiskey Wednesday with Vinny's Beverage Depot. I am Pat, joined by Brett from the Whiskey Hotline as usual. Our guest today, Scotty Neal, co-founder of Horse Soldier Bourbon. We're going to hear all, all about kind of vision behind this, you know, fledgling distillery brand and uh, what these whiskeys are all about. Hopefully you have someone taste along with us at home because they are excellent whiskeys. If you have any questions today, please use the Q&A function at the bottom and we'll make sure you get it, we get everything answered for you. So outside of Scott, Scott, you want to uh, kind of tell everybody how you got into this and so how you ended up from uh, a war guy to a whiskey guy. <laughs> how we went from uh, making whiskey, not war. So, you know, That's starting on the bad. whiskey side, about 2015, my friend John Coco and I and his wife Elizabeth, I had just gotten out of the military and I was uh, working for the Green Beret Foundation, which is a nonprofit that supported Green Berets. And I started a program that taught us, you know, how to start a business and get back into society and, and kind of find your second life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things is find a mentor. And John had been very successful in business. He's from Louisville. And so he says, let's go uh, take a trip to Yellowstone. So we climbed the Tetons and we rode uh, horseback through the middle of the thoroughfare. And towards the end of the trip, we stopped at our first craft distillery called the Grand Tetons. And they just made vodka. And it was a husband and wife team. And we must have spent three hours in there trying all their vodkas, seeing our first distillery tour. Uh, Elizabeth, who came from the perfume and packaging industry, would touch the bottle and would just ask a thousand questions. We became so curious that then we uh, Googled the next one and the next one and the next one. It took us three weeks to get back home. And it was John's mom that said, you drunks need a hobby. <laughs> because that's all we talked about was these great distilleries we visited. So we called some more of our army buddies up and said, hey, would you like to go to Scotland? And it was the queen's 90th birthday and she had the military tattoo. And if you don't know what that is, it's when all the bagpipe players come in and play uh, at Edinburgh Castle. So we decided to go to Whiskey University. And we started to understand, you know, the science and the history and, you know, how to smell whiskeys and taste them and you know, see the world's oldest collection. And then like anybody else, we started going up and down space side. We really had no time frame. We're a bunch of retired military vets, right? And we had a small pension. And so we get to a small town in Thurso, Scotland. It's the northernmost town. And they make a product called Wolfburn. Yeah. Well, it turns out Mark, who Chris Hemsworth played in the movie, uh, served with the owner in uh, I Iraq. And so he let us in behind the scenes. So it was no longer the velvet rope, move along folks, nothing to see. It was, you know, let's turn on the stills, let's fire up uh, the boilers, let's get the mashing started. And we spent probably two to three weeks and that head distiller had just left Glen Fittich and he was trying to make a name for himself with a young brand. So we got to learn a lot and not only the art of making um, uh, whiskey, but also the business side of it, right? What it took to really start a business, the equipment needs, the start of capital and funding. We came home for a few weeks, we went to Ireland. Okay, why not? What's the difference? So we went and see the Teeling brothers. We were introduced through a connection and we spent time talking to them. They recently had sold uh, Kel Bagan, the world's oldest distillery to Beams and Tory. We talked about transactions. And then he had an American distiller there in Dublin that really started his brand again. So once again, you talk about building a new distillery, what does it take, you yeah. know, all of this process. We came back, we went into Kentucky and because of, you know, our military past and what we had a passion for, a lot of people started letting us into the warehouses. So we learned a lot about, um, you know, warehousing. We spent some time cutting trees in Missouri with a cooperage to learn how to make barrels. So it was almost like learning Kung Fu. You just went and seen more and more and more to really understand the art and science. So we put together this business in 2015. We didn't have a distillery at the time. We realized, uh, as I was joking early, the number one ingredient in whiskey is money, Yeah. right? And that's why craft, you know, I give all the credit to small craft businesses yeah. because they have nothing right? And they're trying to do the best they can. Maybe they have a passion for making it, or maybe they were former businessmen or investors, but it really takes a lot. So we partnered with uh, Ryan Lang in Ohio, 
he had just left Kentucky and he had partnered trying to build his own brand and built a brand new uh, 1.5 million gallon facility, uh, beautiful Vendomes, you know, 9,000 gallon fermenters, everything you would want in a brand new distillery. And so we would leave here from uh, Tampa, Florida and fly on a Legionnaire, 65 bucks a flight, uh, stay in a bed and breakfast and spend a week at a time making about 100 barrels. So that's what really started the brand. What accelerated a brand is when this silly little movie came out called 12 Strong. Now 12 Strong, uh, Chris Hemsworth and Michael Shannon was about a small Green Beret team that went in behind the lines in Afghanistan and faced 50,000 Taliban. Before that, nobody knew about us and knew our story, right? There was a little book called uh, The Horse Soldiers, but we all had fake names in it, so nobody knew it was us. So now all of a sudden you're thrust in the limelight and uh, we were asked at the movie premiere if we ha had any of our bourbon ready to go. So we weren't even ready to launch our brand or anything yet, it was still aging, but we went ahead and did it. Uh, we sourced a little bit, about a thousand um, um, cases worth just to have it for the first premiere and it really just took off. Why did it take off? Uh, we'll talk some more about that. It's because just like Kung Fu, everything we do, you know, we're ex-military, we're very meticulous about the process. We're very mm -hmm. meticulous about the aging. We're very meticulous about the packaging and branding. And so far we believe it's paying off. So what is you, so you guys had just started, what, what packaging were you just for that one out of the, I mean, we know that you Middle West, right, was where the yeah. original whiskey was sourced from, which are great, very reputable. They've got yeah. some great brands. We're hoping to get them in Illinois soon. Um, yeah. <laughs> we're uh, we're uh, uh, also so because your there's a your packaging is pretty elaborate. Mm -hmm. What did you have to bottle in that first sort of scramble? Give me one second. I'm rocking. I'm going to show you the original bottle, and nice. I'll show you what we have today. Give me one second. Check out my my background, full of lovely special ops mementos. <laughs> He really touched on like every part of the business in that wandering, globe-trotting, quasi-apprenticeship, yeah. you know, well, from the barrel thing good. and chopping trees. It's like the only thing he didn't, it seems like the only person you didn't visit in your globe-trotting to yeah. build this brand was a marketing stooge at some point. Well, and you kind of yeah. saw, you kind of saw the right ones too, because look, Wolfburn is great. I've been through Wolfburn and Wolfburn is a great place to go because that's the definition of a craft distillery yeah. of scale. So it's, they're crafty, but they're of scale. I mean, they can produce a yeah. decent amount there. So it's not just, you know, in somebody's garage. It's actually. So that was so the first the one, huh? So this was our very first bottle. We, we, as you know, craft brands, and you look on the shelf or in your bar, they start to look the same, right? And the reason is, is because the glass comes from Mexico or China, or there's some glass brokers, and you have to buy a Tennessee or you have to buy, you know, those are styles of glass. Yeah, and we're like, I just yeah. don't want to look like everybody. There's three things we learned on our journey, right? Number one, it has to look good. Packaging matters, mm -hmm. right? Uh, across the bar, you're competing against things that people are half blind and they can see a Jack Daniels bottle and know it's a Jack Daniels bottle. Number two, it has to taste good. It, nobody cares about your story, packaging, how much money you have or don't have. If it tastes like crap, it's the last bottle they'll ever buy. And number three, right. you have to make and have enough of it. Because if you run out, uh, the retail business will fill the shelf as quick as uh, you can deliver it, and the distributor will move on to something else. So those were the fundamentals. So when we first started, right, we loved this bottle design. It was a little bit unique and different. Uh, you could see it had a metal cap. You know, this is old school. And anytime I see one, if I ever see one in the wild, right, I snatch it up. It had a synthetic cork. Yeah. You know, it misprinted the label to be smaller, right? This is all amateurs, okay, doing it ourselves. So when you said a marketing company, we went to a Napa company, we went to a Madison Avenue company, and they didn't get us. And we said no. So yeah. all of this is, is uh, Elizabeth and her design. So that was iteration number one. Now, this is iteration number two. We have a beautiful uh, metal label. 
Now, when we first decided we wanted metal label, none of the uh, label manufacturers nor the uh, bottling machines that come out of Italy could apply these. We had to hand apply these labels. So we would be in the warehouse 12 hours a day licking and sticking. It probably took 12 of us, our kids and everything. Um, probably we could only do 800 bottles a day. So talk about wow. scalability, quick lesson. It took us seven months to find the machine, calibrate it, do everything to finally apply this metal label. Now, another unique thing is we went to Anchor Glass, which is in uh, several different foundries in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, the old Seagram's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, bottler. You had one in Oklahoma. You had everything else because we wanted American made. When we asked if we could have this bottle kind of customized, they told us that a mold was $60,000 a piece. Holy and cow. we about fell out of our chair. Then and they how many molds, us, just so you know, how many molds do you need? Seven. Seven to run a bottling line. So I'm just sitting there, you know, my heart is sunk down. I, you know, we're not at that level. And I asked what the heck, you know, costs so much. If you want to see a bottle mold, look right behind me. See those two okay. shiny objects? Yeah. You can kind of see a bottle fits in it. It closes a molten piece of glass comes in. They blow an air nozzle, it forms into a glass, right? So I asked them, why, why does it cost so much? And the United Steel Worker Union rep said, well, it's this particular type of steel. And I said, okay, well, what if I was to get you that kind of steel? Could I get a discount? And what he didn't know or realize is it was a similar type of steel that was used in the World Trade Center. How did I know that? Is because we buried pieces of it all along the battlefield in the early days of 9-11. And we have a statue at Ground Zero, which is actually the image of the special operator on a horse called America's Response Monument. So we had very good relationships with the Port Authority that controlled the steel. And so I called them up after the meeting and said, uh, can I get some steel we're making whiskey and I want to have a bottle mold made. And they said yes. And they actually shipped the steel to the foundry in West Virginia that actually poured and created the World Trade Center in the 60s. Wow. So it was a lot of story, but it wasn't because a Madison Avenue marketing company thought of it. It was because literally we were broke vets trying to start a company and a brand and we just wanted a discount. So well, you're, you're using your network, you know? But well, in Chicago, you would just say, I got a guy. I got a guy got that's a got guy. some steel from the World I Trade Center. Somebody. And you don't say their name until you come to terms. Yeah. But that's the, a lot of the packaging. So our packaging is involved. We now have a, um, a regular cork from Portugal. So everything here is American made, but the cork, obviously. Mm -hmm. And as you can see across our product line, you know, we're, I hope, to be known now as the metal label. Why? Because on your bar, it looks like jewelry. And that's what the wives wanted. So remember, one of our fundamentals is look good, right? Unlike the Navy SEALs, they have lots of hair care products. At least our whiskey looks good. <laughs> so should we start on a little tasting? Yeah. Which one should we start with? I like to start with the premium, the straight bourbon. It's more of the copper label, right? Mm -hmm. This is a uh, more of a rye bourbon, and some people ask why rye. Well, number one, rye, as you know, is a little spicier, a little pepperier. Bartenders like it, and imagine our business, how many bartenders we've got to talk to, right? Oh, yeah. Whether it's ther therapy or, you know what I mean, it's mixology, one or the other, but rye is a preferred drink in most of your old fashions, Manhattans and whatnot, because rye comes through all those ingredients and you still feel like you've got your money's worth. Whereas sometimes weeded and lesser, you know, they get hidden behind the ingredients and you're like, well, did I get my money? So we decided to start with a rye um, and pour some, As you, you know, it's hard to tell in this video, you can even tell in some of the cues, right, on the aging and what rye does as well. So it's fun to learn that aspect of it. But like anything else, you know, this one here last year won double gold in San Francisco. 
This is our product. It's a three and a half year old. Once again, we must have listened to somebody right because yep. uh, our first release, you know, is still a younger spirit. We talked about this earlier. It's the truth. I wish I was 10 years old, but it's not. But, you know, it makes for a good uh, um, cocktail. I don't think I have a lot of people that ask for it neat or straight, right? And it comes in at 87 proof. Um, but it really is, uh, you know, a, a great bourbon. I do these tastings all over with these three products we have, and it's equal across the board who likes what. Mm -hmm. So you never know what people well, like for their taste. Well, and bear in mind that there's, I mean, and, and even the laws sometimes are driven. Look, we're not, the one thing that we're not ageist, especially when it comes to bourbon, and quite frankly, you've got a very good chance of having something as early as three years old depending upon where it was aged, how it was done, you could have, we've had some product that's three years old that's absolutely outstanding. Yeah. So three and a half is, it's just the beginning, but it's absolutely a viable point. Again, because there is, you know, the, because it may be at three and a half years old with this, all the green character that you get in younger whiskey has started mm -hmm. to fade because people yep. don't understand that early on a whole bunch of flavor goes in and you need that little bit of extra time for things to go out. Yeah. That's I why think this the, is the excellent process, you know, became important. And, and why did we go understand barrels? We started at a small cooperage, you know, to, to really understand, you know, the, the, the type of trees that are selected, that they're about 60 to 75 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, you get into the nerd science of the rings, right? And the, the bark and the climatic, you know, effects of where they are, whether in the Missouri or Kentucky or Kansas area. Uh, all the way up to Minnesota, then you start to understand how important is the yard drying process, right? So as you allow that greenness in the wood to slowly dry, but you can't dry it too fast, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you still even put water on it, but you give it a natural amount of time, and then you kiln dry it at the end just to make sure, and then poof, it takes, you know, about a day, day and a half to assemble a good barrel, and then we chose a number four alligator char, one, because we're from Florida and we like the name, it's ha-ha. <laughs> but um, it, it does give you, you know, the best charring for the charcoal effect that we were hoping to look for. Remember, we had no clue. We followed advice, uh, science, everything, and we, we, we put it away and we test it every six months. So, Can you, you know, share what cooperage you're using for these barrels? We started off with a small cooperage called Barrel 53. They weren't able to keep up, so now we're in space side. Okay. I think once we finally grow, we're to the point where we'll negotiate with, um, you know, some of the bigger firms where we actually lease the barrel, and they go to Scotland afterwards. So hmm. we're at the point now where we have so many truckloads of barrels. I'm uh, surprised. That I'm surprised Speyside doesn't do that. I'm surprised Speyside doesn't do that for you because they're they Scottish based. Because Calvin they certainly does as well. Calvin yeah. is another thing. Calvin absolutely does that. Once again, you don't know about the barrel yeah. mafia, but you know it is <laughs> the number one costliest product, and uh, it's about sixty to seventy percent of your flavoring and hundred percent of your coloring. Most color comes in in six months to a year. Right, so it comes in pretty fast, especially with a number four chart. And then, as you were talking about early, it starts to take some of the harder um, oils and esters and, and all of that, you yep. know, maturation. Now, we have just spent the last month and a half on every warehouse design in the world because we're building our facility in Kentucky. When I tell you, we know every science, we've been to the University of Kentucky. We've talked to every master distiller. Um, the opinions vary, right? And we've listened to all of them. But what they all say is the barrel, the barrel, the barrel, right? And so that's where we don't want to skimp. But it is the number one most costliest part of this whole process. Yeah. So. Hmm. This, I think this whiskey drinks great for its age. I think it's just, it's beautiful, neat. It's, it's full bodied for, for its youth. It's not unbalanced. It's got a lot of nice fruit. It's got a lot of nice caramel. I think it's great, man. This is really good. I, you know, we're really happy with it. I haven't changed anything. You know, what the hard part is trying to doubt yourself and change midstream. 
-hmm. you know, it, is it, you know, when we were first tasting it at six months a year and everything, you try to see if there's any off flavors, if the yeast maybe wasn't right or correct for it, all those things. But after a while, I mean, this is like our children. This is, you know, one of my special kids, right? So we're very happy with it. Uh, we have barrels aging even longer. I, you know, it's, you know, I've got a five-year-old coming up. Give me a couple years, I'll have a seven-year-old. Yeah. So we'll see what this does as it gets older. But um, three and a half years, it tastes pretty good. And it's 87 proof. We tried it every single proof level, and we felt that this uh, 87 was the best. So can I ask you a few technical questions on the distilling side with this? Um, what proof are you going into the barrels at? With the rye, we're probably at 128 to 130, right? You can get a little higher in your proof. Uh, not, no, no, never mind. In your distillation proof. Distillation, yes. And then on the proof, we're probably 124, right at the limit of 125, a okay. little bit under. The weeded, we go in about 120. Okay. And what's, uh, right. and this is just, so the small, the straight we tried first, is a rye grain bourbon. Um, how much rye is in there? 27 percent rye. That's a lot of rye. You need a little bit more barley yeah, because uh, yeah. rye is a hard grain to turn on the yeast, mm -hmm. right? So the bar barley content's a little bit higher. Um, and then corn, obviously, you got to have corn. But, you know, w when they started this, number one, we're bourbon fans. We didn't want a high rye product, right? Mm -hmm. We wanted what we wanted and we love bourbon. So, um, you know, do we want to make a higher rye product? I just think there's a lot of folks out there right now uh, that are, you know, into the high 90s for a rye product. And so we're going to stick to our, our uh, rye bourbon and yeah. our wheat bourbon for now. All right, cool. That one's great. Um, Brett, what are, what's our price on those right now? On the They are right the, the straight is $49.99. And then the, the two coming up, the uh, the small batch is sixty nine ninety nine, barrel proof is eighty nine ninety nine. Okay. Well, are we going small batch next then, Scotty? Of course we are. So I've got three bottles, and they're all Goldilocks, good, better, best. <laughs> That's the fun part about it. This was our first uh, weeded, which when we call it small batch. Now remember, people use small batch because. It's easy and it's not regulated by TTB. Because so it sounds good. Game. Yeah. I mean, small batch. Batch of what? Cookies? No, but for us, a small batch is about six, seven to nine barrels at the most. So just like you see your, your, your Rick House behind you, we'll lay out 100 barrels when it comes to dump day and we'll start tasting. Uh, obviously, the straights on one side, the rye and the wheat is on the other. And first thing you do is you open up the bung, you let it breathe, you come by and smell. Now the wives and uh, all the kids and everybody that takes part in this because I myself have been blown up so many times, I can't smell that good. I actually have to take smell kits to start to learn vanillas and cherries and other things. So there's others, especially the ladies that are really good uh, about their scents and their palates. But first thing you just wanna take a quick whiff and you'll start noticing each one's different across the board. And then you start doing like a big game of concentration. You're getting consistency in smells. Uh, so you, you kind of identify it. And then you take your first dram, you pour it in there, you set it on the barrel. Nobody does any makeup for the wives. We don't brush our teeth with minty stuff. And it's just so your palate is fresh. And you just start going down the line. And what you're looking for is off flavors, number one, anything. And you can tell young ones, you got to push the barrel backwards and say that one needs more time, right? If it's really good, okay, you move it forward. And if it's exceptional, you, you move it double forward and that becomes your barrel strength. So that's how we select this process. So when we say a small batch, you usually use between six and eight, you know, because, um, you know, by the time it's five years old, you've probably lost, you know, 15% at the most, right? Unless there's some mm -hmm. kind of leakage. Uh, so the barrel yields pretty good. But with the small batch, we wanted to go a little bit lower proof than barrel strength and it's 95. Okay, so this, like all weeded, 
I call these little victories. They're softer, they're sweeter. Ladies tend to like them if they haven't had whiskeys and bourbons before. So we have a lot of ladies that grow up on wine and, uh, you know, they, they like to be introduced to something. We usually start with uh, the small batch. How much wheat's in here? Uh, 70, 20, 10. Okay. So 20% wheat. wheat. That's a lot of wheat. Wheat is grain of sweet, just like bread, right, versus mm -hmm. rye. But wheat takes a little bit longer in aging uh, for it to kind of soften and round everything yeah, else. I agree. So that's why you get your old wellers and your old pappies. And, you know, the others tend to be longer because they really just settle and soften and they become really good. So that's our small batch. Well, You're this is a higher method. portion of wheat, too. This is also yeah, a, very, that's a, a high higher portion, portion of wheat. Of wheat. Yeah. And you're right, by the way, on the female thing, it's actually physiologically women's olfactory senses are sharper. That, mm -hmm. is, yes. that, is a, that is a gender fact. In fact, if you travel in Mexico, I, it just, I know mm -hmm. it's complete. In Mexico, in tequila labs of all the big companies, you will almost never see a male running a tequila lab in Mexico. It's all females doing the, the all the, all the organic. Yeah. yeah, all the sensory. Scotty, your tasting salt. method is uh, very similar to master distiller Jimmy Russell. Jimmy Russell, We've tasted right. with him. Whenever we're tasting barrels with Jimmy, the way he judges it, he doesn't even taste them anymore. He just smells them. And if he pushes the glass a little toward the circle in the middle of the tasting mat, that's how he tells it's a good one. And he goes back and the farther he pushes it up on the mat, they are the better barrels for him. It's almost the exact it, same. It is. It, it, once you start understanding that Mother Nature reacts differently from, you know, making it, it as long as you do the same, 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 right? You know, the grains and everything, the milling, the consistency, that's predictable. When you get your barrels, it's good if you're a large company and you could buy them from a cooper and you trust how they select the slaves, right? And so mm -hmm. all of this process becomes consistency. And when it comes to the flavor at the end, it, it, you, there's no machine that ever will be invented that can replicate what a human can smell and taste, right? And so that knowledge is where we learn every day. And some people are very smart, but we have some younger um, people on our team. Hunter, uh, one of the sons is a fabulous palate, ridiculous. I think he's BSing me half the time, but <laughs> it's true, he, can, he knows. And we have to rely on that. And that's been the best part of learning this and our brand is, is being there every step of the way. All right. This is yeah, great. And that would be I straight, love how yeah, I love that, what a weeder this is. This is classic weeded bourbon, really. Yep, and you can't. Yeah, this one would be fairly. You could guess this. This is a lot reminiscent, and the mash bill is pretty close, but it's a lot reminiscent about some of the things that come out of Heaven Hill, mm -hmm. i.e., yeah. larceny, and some of the things that come out of Luxrell, which are both that higher. That's the highest portion of wheat, by the way, of any of the weeded mash bills. That's actually a weeded bourbon. That's the highest portion of wheat of any of them. Yeah. Yeah, I, we haven't tried to, to, to tickle our mash bill, you know what I mean? We're, we've mm -hmm. got to make what we know so far. I would love to try a few variants up and down one day. You know, as we get a little bigger, I could set aside a day, you know what I mean, to produce wow. barrels just to see what she'll do. But for now, we're, we're very happy on what we have with a small batch. And, and now my favorite child, right, is uh, the barrel strength. Um, this one here is 114 proof. You know, we've got to write what it is. Yeah. And it varies between 110 to 117, right? Um, the one know, Brett and I have is 114.6. So it's a little breathe for half a second, right? I got to smudge on my glass. And then, you know, what I like to do, you know, is the left nostril, right nostril. Okay, because your brain smells in three dimensions, it'll pick cues up on either side of your nose. Don't get too close because of foolproof. Now, if you go back to your small batch or even your uh, straight, it's a great way for, for others to start to understand why nosing is such an important process, right? 
because by the time you open up uh, your taste buds and everything, your brain now is in overdrive and it's ready to smell even more details of either one. So cheers on the uh, barrel strength. This is outstanding. Um, now, where's this mash bill land? Is it just one of the other two? Same, 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 same. but it's barrel strength. Yeah, and this one is, the, it's interesting too how that much, cause now you've got like some rope licorice anise, yeah. that sort of licorice root anise that really dry, the, that's the wood. That's the first thing that comes out with the, 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 the lack of water is the wood really comes forward. And this is actually when you can taste that, that it might be a little bit younger. This is, or what are the age on these? Are these also the, the three and a half year old age statement or are they a oh, little bit older? Five. These, these are, are five. five. Okay. Yep. The first ones we made and, uh, you know, I, I like to take the barrel strength and I'll just put it in my, my mouth and just leave it there for a bit. Right. And then start to swallow it some. And I think that's where I get the licorice part out of it. Yep. So I'm just learning myself the nuances yeah. of tasting. Uh, but uh, this is my favorite because I, I don't add anything. I'm in Florida, it's hot. So just a little bit, no ice cube or anything. Uh, there's certainly a lot of folks who likes it on the rocks or to add water and that'll change it as it goes. But uh, my favorite by far is the barrel strength. It's outstanding, absolutely outstanding bourbon. So that's, uh, you know, once again, we're, we are a growing young company. We don't have fantasies and visions of selling, right? I tell everybody, um, you know, we want to give our kids a legacy. They can't, you know, eat our war medals, right? They don't, we didn't get anything from movies and books. Uh, we wanted to leave them a little bit more. And also, you know, we started this together. I think whereas we served together as men, but our families were left behind. This business has allowed us all to take a role and kind of you know, start a family business together. So as a distiller now, um, yep. two questions. What would you say has been the most surprising thing for you uh, starting a whiskey distiller and a whiskey brand? And uh, which part of the whiskey business would you describe as the most combative? Uh, I'll start with combative because I like combat. You, you forget our <laughs> background is I compete against a thousand other brands, right? That mm -hmm. are 200 years old and they have uh, a billion dollar publicly traded company behind it. Uh, they have reputation, they have everything. And you really gotta fight to elbow your way onto the shelf. I like it, I'm not afraid, I'll do the Pepsi challenge. I admire those that are great bourbons and I'll mm -hmm. highlight the ones that aren't. But for me, uh, we've been successful because we're honest and we just tell a story of the American dream, right? Uh, if you look out, there's a book called um, Bourbons and Bullets. It's about all the distilleries that were started by veterans or veterans that worked there. So a lot of your favorite brands were, you know, guys and gals that came home and they went back to work. And mm -hmm. so that's the only story we're trying to tell. Don't buy us because we're veterans, buy it because we're good. Yeah, it is so good. Com combating you know, perceptions and everything. The other part is, uh, what was your first question? Can't even remember. I guess what's, what's been the biggest surprise for you starting a distillery? Uh, the number one ingredient is money. Uh, it, you, if you want to go big and you want to compete and you see yourself as a generational brand, you can never underestimate the amount of resources you require. Yeah. Because not only do I have to make it, okay, and it has to sit there five, six, or hopefully, you know, seven years, you know, you still got to make money and feed your family, right? So that's why a lot of distilleries start with clear goods, and they try to build and uh, just turn over their tasting rooms. We took the other approach. We're lucky we had a small retirement from our military, and we're very disciplined. So we don't waste things. We don't give away you know, things that others in industry, this, they throw a lot of money in front of their brand, mm -hmm. right? To, to kind of suck start it. And we just didn't have that. We would hustle. I told anybody, you can call me at any time. I can drive as far as my car will go and uh, I'll come, you know, help with my product. And so, you know, those disciplines have helped us now 
you know, we've not only finished our facility here in St. Pete, Florida, uh, but we're building on 200 acres in Somerset, Kentucky, you know, a, a 6 million gallon facility. So success brings success. Uh, we've attracted the right kind of patient investors. They know we're not in it to spend their money. Uh, that gives us the ability to grow this brand against any other brand in the country. That was my next question about the new distiller in Kentucky. So you've sure. 6 million gallons. That is, that's a hoss now. And you're doing, and everything's going to be aging on site, all that um, bottling hall, all that jazz. I mean, the only thing you're doing there is not making your own barrels, I assume. Yeah. Somerset, Kentucky's uh, right on Lake Cumberland. It's about an hour south off the trail. We, we don't mind being out in the woods, right? And that's how yeah. we spend our life. Uh, it's a very welcoming community. The, the, the town and the, the city government has been very favorable. But what we've been doing is we've been looking towards the next 100 years. What is the right warehouse? What is the right uh, humidity monitors? You know, all of those uh, green energies, the right boilers and chillers, uh, thermal energies. We really have a blank canvas where some brands they are trying to piece together a 100-year-old building with a 50-year-old building and a 20-year-old warehouse. We really have a blank canvas, and we're spending the amount of time traveling. Uh, we've, we've got some pretty good architects that build the most popular distilleries in Kentucky, and we have a fabulous architect that just finished McAllen's. So what do we want? We want something for the next 100 years. Uh, it will be here. It's locked in our family trust. Um, we'll be there. Uh, our kids, you know, will be there as much as they want to work. And, you know, but we get to do it right. We have enough warehousing capacity and land. 200 acres is quite a bit. We'll have yeah. a hotel and a restaurant because people want to stay and play. Uh, we thought through a lot of things. That's cool. When do you when do you think something like that's going to be done? I mean, I, I assume that's a hell of a project that's going to take years. That's about a three year project. Okay. So remember, by the time I turn the stills on, I still got another six to seven years before I drink it. So it's a decade from now before my product. So we'll still continue our relationship uh, with uh, in Ohio. Mm -hmm. Right. And at some point, you know, we want to keep the consistency of our taste and profile, but we are going to have to make the hard change you know, into what will be a generational brand. Yeah. Uh, we got a question from uh, Larry here, and he asks, how many of the Horse Soldier Green Beret team is involved in the distillery? So there's five of us. Uh, there's nine of us all together that are Green Berets. We served at different times. You got Mark, Bob, myself, Billy, Will. Um, you know, some of the other guys really – don't want much to do. They, they live in the hills and they're quite happy with their happy life. Uh, we have some other Green Berets we served with, you know, all throughout our careers that are involved. Uh, we hire veterans when we can and we hire experts when we can. Mm -hmm. So we've got a pretty good cross-cultural team. Cool. We did, did no, that's and that that's a good testament because we have one of the things that is the greatest compliment about this brand. We get a lot of inquiries about a lot of different groups that are of current interest, right? And and we went through a whole phase where we were getting a lot of questions from vets that were looking for veteran owned businesses. And when we started doing some research that we realized that a lot of people it wasn't quite the depth and the care of a veteran owned and might not have been as truly veteran owned as others. And, you know, having a number of very close friends that are veterans for all the way going back to, I mean, we have a couple of men or at least one man who unfortunately we just lost who worked for Vinnie's who was a world war II bombardier. Right. Uh -huh. We've had people that have worked for us that were, you know, we're in Korea and Vietnam and you think of them when you try to answer that question. So it's nice to know that there's a, a veterans, a veteran owned business that it really is very organic about the treatment. And it's like, it's a lifestyle. It's not just throw some money at it, you know, get a 501c3, throw some money at it. And yeah, it's, um, you know, we've, because of our story became more popular, you start finding a lot of veterans that are either working in the industry or had started something and they, either they over promoted that they were veterans mm -hmm. or they did. Right. 
And so what we try to do is become a little bit of a guild and we share knowledge. What I found fascinating about this business is everybody shares to a point, right? Mm -hmm. But they over, you know, share these things because you don't feel like you're competing against them. You're competing against yourself and the market, right? right? So we want to make ourselves better businessmen. That's sometimes where veterans have a hard time. They come back into society. They don't have access to investment and capital. You know what I mean? They, they, you know, have the work ethic to be a great, you know, business. So there's other things that we discuss as a group to make each one. We share uh, our cost of goods and suppliers and we find better pricing together. You know, those are the good things you want to hear about what veterans do is they're sharing their knowledge to make sure each one's uh, just as successful as the next. Yeah, and there, and you're right. That is, it's an interesting thing, and probably the the sense of community is probably the greatest on the production side. I mean, you're at the yeah. ground; it gets a little bit more. Anytime, once you get marketing involved, then the competition and the mudslinging starts. But as long as it's you just know, the people on the ground making some, things, some veterans brands, and they're very red, white, and blue, right? They're very eagle, mm-hmm. and and America is the raw, raw, raw. Uh, you know, our van, our brand, we try to think ultra premium and, and, and sophisticated. There's enough storytelling, but it's not in your face. Others try to use visual bottles that look like canteens, but you know, that's all their decisions, right? I don't say left or right. I just try to understand the thought process of the picking of things and always, you know, I never want to be felt that the community doesn't want to call us for help or we don't want to call somebody else, right? Because right? then you're bragging, and that's a no-no for soldiers. Right. Well, and but you've also, it's been processed. The whole thing has been process-oriented. It's not, it is, it's, it so happens that you're all together because you're veterans and you have that shared experience. But really, the core of what ends up in the bottle is, is all a part of the process. Yeah, like you and said, you're it's, right. it's, it's, if, you know, it's the product right? ought to speak the for whole, itself. That whole Lean Six Sigma you know what I mean? You, you, if you follow, you know, uh, uh, a plan, right? So military, we're all about the operations order, how much resources, who, what, when, where, why, you know, the, the planning process is, becomes very intuitive. The primary alternate t- contingency emergency, all of those were instilled in us when we're in. The problem is you get to the business world and you think you don't know what you should be doing. You're scared of some of the business terms and financing terms. And that's where we help young companies understand that they have the skills. Uh, we try to share networking and connectivity, just like the uh, um, American Distillers Institute or any of the others do for craft distillers. So if that's their cho- chosen profession, let us help you as much as we can. Sure. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a, that, <coughs> that's something we've always said that we we want to, it's the competition part. We want to be number one, but it's nice to be number one in a vibrant market, right? Yeah. You don't want to be number one in a stale one. You want to be number one in a vibrant one. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I want to climb to the mountain a little faster than most, right? Because I worked out harder. But <laughs> it, it, you know, the competition rests within ourselves. Are we making a better product, right? Are we marketing our brand properly? Are we, you know, do we have personal relationships with our, retail and our you know off premise that's where we're tireless people want to hear from us and talk to us and see us right and we're always going to be here for that part um what we don't want to become is distant and unknown that we're a faceless and nameless brand you don't know who's behind it why they're doing it you know why i should adopt it as something that should go on the back of my bar so we spend a lot of time, you know, communicating up and down, which is counterintuitive to what we used to do. Remember, nobody knew who we were. Even in the movie, had fake names. Hmm. So right. but now it's our business. That's what we used to do. This is what we do now. Man, I'm, I can't stress enough, everyone who's watching this, how good this barrel strength is. This is really phenomenal juice. Um, My favorite child. Great. Yeah. Great. Well, well we're Scotty, trying yeah. product innovations. You know, obviously double casking. You know, we're we're, we're 
we're understanding that we've made some rum we're casking the rum just because we learned how to sail one year and we sailed to cuba and we jumped ship and we went to old havana and legendario and learned there um so we're, we're messing around with some rums um you know i, I love to see how double cast is going to go we jumped into normandy last year for the 75th anniversary of d-day and if you guys remember Band of Brothers, right? Mm -hmm. So that one objective where he had to go attack all the artillery pieces in Bittencourt. Well, he makes Calvados, that farm there. Yep. So he led us in there and he taught us Calvados. And so now we're doing a barrel exchange. And we're, you know, that's the fun part about this is all these relationships. We miss going to Japan for the Olympics this year because of COVID. And we wanted to do some training in some of the Japanese distilleries. So our fun part is every year we have an adventure and we learn something new. So hopefully if we do release something out, probably limited qualities. If it sucks, just tell us. But, you know, we, we, we think we'll, we'll make some fun stuff here and there. That's really well, cool. What is, you've had some special releases. Are there any pending special releases that you have in the bottle ready to roll? So we have a, a series called Commander Select. Now, we didn't make these. We were given uh, access to, to the Rick Houses for some very aged bourbon as we were learning ourselves how to really tell when a bourbon tips. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's getting a little too aged. Um, we talked about wanting a charity bottle, and it's called Commander Select. Let me grab this one here. Uh, So you can see it's a beautiful black label on this one, right? It comes with a military challenge coin, if you know what those are. Yep. And it comes with a, had to learn this word, sorry, bespoke box, right? <laughs> yes. And, and so each year is different. And this year we're coming out with, uh, at the end of the month, our commander select number three. It's a 13-year-old Kentucky bourbon. It's coming out at 132 proof. Wow. And you're wondering how could a bourbon come out that proof? Well, it's because the water evaporates. Mm -hmm. It's higher in proof in alcohol. And uh, it, it is, it, it's a bold adventure, right? I had to start learning how to enjoy the higher proof, but it's got so much hidden inside of it. But uh, it comes with a different box. And then finally, uh, next year's the 20th anniversary of D-Day, right? And so we're looking at something special for that. These bottles, we said, all right, throw a price on it. We said $595, and everybody laughed. You're laughing. I could yeah. see it. Yeah. it. It's because the Special Forces team number is 595. Okay. So, uh, and the reason why we made these was to actually fund the statue at Ground Zero, right? I'll show you the little statue. Because when we had it built and donated, we didn't have any sustainment money. And you gotta put flowers on it, you gotta have it cleaned. Yeah. It's gotta have things done to it. So we said this money, or at least our portion, would go to fund the cleanup of the statue. Now, when I go and do a whiskey and war stories for groups, these bottles have gone for up to $15,000 a bottle. Wow. Because wow. they're buying the story and the emotion and we sign them all by the horse soldiers. So this series became our way to give back to the community. That's Remember, really cool. we were pets, it takes a lot of money. Everybody was asking us to support X, Y, and Z, which we want to. And this first became a way to support the statue. And now we do appearances all across the country, uh, big galas and charity events. And uh, you know, by telling the story and auctioning this bottle, it brings a lot of money to whoever uh, the partner charity is. So we're very proud of that. We don't keep anything. Uh, the distributor gets theirs, the retailers get theirs. And uh, that's, that's been a very good uh, program for us. That's really great. Thank you. All right, cool. And yeah. people can, if people are looking for information on that, they can probably find it out on your social medias and website and all Our that. Our social media and, uh, you know, we'll, it, the next version will come out. These are already gone. We only make 2,000 at a time. So the next ones will come mm -hmm. out probably by the end of the month. And then all the way up until uh, August next year. And then, of course, September 11th next year is the 20th anniversary. So we'll do something special for, to commemorate that. So, 
there's still some others out there somewhere. Every once in a while, you'll find one at a, uh, at a, a store or in a restaurant. I, I laugh every time I see it. Remember, starting this business, you didn't think you'd be here. And we'll go into, you know, some of our states and I'll look at it and I'll stop because it's right there. So mm -hmm. that's probably the best feeling in the world to say, I made that. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're very absolutely. Proud. No, that's very cool. That's awesome. Cool. Well, Scotty, thanks a lot for your time today, man. I appreciate you running through these whiskeys for us and hopefully people can uh, see this video on the Facebook page there and learn a little, learn a little bit more about this brand. Cause you know, there's a lot of brands out there that are just some story. Like you alluded to it earlier, you know, it's oh somebody's great grandfather's father's father, you know, uh, got hit in the head by a branch one day and then he started old branch bourbon or something, you know, and, it, and it's just a bunch of bullshit. And this is a Origin. bourbon with a, with a real story behind it for once and with juice that totally backs it up. So, um, well, you know, we're proud to carry, man. It's, it's awesome whiskey and uh, best luck to you going forward. I can't wait to see this giant new playground distillery in Kentucky in a few years. I'm, I'm sure, you know, I'm going to be up there. Hopefully all of this mess gets behind us in America, just like after 9-11 awakens again. And I'd love to sit down and visit with everybody. So hopefully we can see each other in the future. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it again, yeah. Scotty. Everybody else, thanks for joining us. Um, Brett and I will be back next week with more Whiskey Wednesday and uh, Mezcal Monday. So until then, see you guys later. Yeah, Mezcal Good. Monday. You're missing out, Scotty. <laughs> thanks. Thank you for see your service. Everyone. Thank you. Yep. All right. Bye-bye.